sky. Stories to give. The ones who make it there ain't can make it back. Salutations and shit, folks. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to another episode of your favorite travel podcast, Travel and Shit, where I, your host, D. Carey, have an experiential conversation about the nuanced ways that travel intersects with regular life. Um, if you care to watch me do a lot of talking with my hands, feel free to listen to this episode on the YouTubes. The link for that will be in the description of the episode. So if you are listening on um, iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, whatever your jam is, feel free to uh, give a view as well if you want to see what the t-shirt of the day is. I love a good black t-shirt and um, today's is really cute. I actually got this from, I want to say ConvertKit, who is the, I guess the provider or the host or the platform that I have my mailing list on. So if you aren't part of that, please join because I've got a couple of things in the workings and I would love for you to be able to hear about them first. So the link for the um, mailing list is also in the description box. And um, I don't send emails often because I have to write them. And um, we won't be flooding your inbox. And by we, I mean I, me, myself. So promise you that there. This week's episode is based on a little uh, trend going on on the social medias I've noticed. And I say I've noticed because I am not really consistent with social media. I pop in, check it here and there, and then I pop back out. I find that now I'm more into Twitter and um, you can find me there underscore D carry or T R A V E L the letter N S H underscore T. So it's basically the same as my Instagram handles. Um, I'm digging Twitter more now. I haven't used Twitter since I was like right out of college, but, um, I'm here for the articles, honestly, and the discourse, see what all the streets is talking about. Uh, but other than I mentioned that to say, that one of the trends that I have enjoyed a bit is cancelable takes. So of course I'm going to do travel takes that um, we're canceling people over. So y'all can feel free to cancel me for the travel takes that I'm going to share with you this week. So um, I don't know who, honestly, I really think that most of y'all are going to agree with me, but (laughs) I am open to you not agreeing with me, but I'd be curious to know what you guys agree with or don't agree with. So after listening to the episode, midway through the episode, whatever, you know, triggers you or strikes your heart as, yeah, bro, I agree. Please shoot me an email or shoot me a DM on whatever social media you fuck with. Cause I get that I don't fuck with them all. So I'm sure y'all don't fuck with them all. Um, but hit me up, let me know that you listen to the episode and let me know which takes you agree with or disagree with. Um, starting with bored from the fucking back. I, for the life of me, do not understand boarding from the front. I think that first class business class is a little tiny bit elitist. Um, I I mean, it's, we're all on a metal box. We're all getting there at the same time, having nicer things for people that can afford more. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I'm not totally against it, but I wouldn't say that I don't necessarily have mixed feelings on it, you know? Um, And could that be because I can't afford first class or business class? Very likely. That's very likely why. But I think that whole, especially when it comes to the bathroom, that little curtain, that's not stopping me, bro. If I'm like rows 10 and up and there's somebody at like the back bathroom, I'm going to the bathroom that's closest to me, period. Like, I'm not doing all that go all the way to the back shit. Like, y'all got to put a door there if you don't really want us there. Do that. 
um, put an actual door if need be. But that curtain, fuck your curtain. I'm going to the bathroom that's closest to me. But, so I guess that's a cancelable take. Um, I un- I get, I understand, right? That um, the benefit to spending more is exclusivity, having access to things that other people don't. But if that is truly what you intend to have happen, then put a door there because I'm grown and I paid quite a bit to be generally quite a bit. I mean, I've been looking at flights and have seen at this point, you could get to Panama, two people from New York city. I think it was like four or $500. St. Thomas is wild cheap. And this is for May travel. Um, St. Thomas is really inexpensive in terms of traveling. So while prices for the most part, and yes, this is a tangent, but while prices for the most part have gone up, if you ask me, they're back to pre-pandemic pricing. And by no means am, is that what my degree is in? I don't know for certain, but in terms of my experience in booking and seeing costs and all that shit, it, it we're no longer in that, hey, we miss you. We really want you to fly. Here's a really low price. I don't think we're there anymore, but um, so I guess that's an extra cancelable take. Fuck your first class curtain. If that bathroom is closer to me, that's the one I'm going to go to, especially if the one in the back is occupied. I'm a very non-confrontational kind of person. So honestly, I go the la- the route of least resistance, the route of least smoke. I don't mind walking to, the- I mean, especially if you're sitting for a long time, I can get a little walk to the back. I don't mind that. But if that is not an option and I've like got to go, say what you got to say after I come out. But I say all that to say, back to my initial take, I don't understand boarding from the front. And I guess that it's because, you know, people paid more to sit in the front of the plane. Uh, but why not just form and function? start at the back. I feel like that would make boarding easier. Go, if you're at the last row, get on first, go to your fucking row. Then you're out the way. I never understood standing and waiting for people to put their stuff in the overhead, you know, move things around from the seat, get back up. Like you can do that out of my way. It's kind of like when driving, if you're lost, be lost on the side, like pull over and be lost. You don't, go 20 miles slower than everybody else just because you're trying to navigate and look at street signs and find out what all is going on, right? Board from the back of the plane. I am hoping that somewhere in the world there is an airline that does board like that. I want to say they did that a lot more, um, not a lot more, but I remember we were on some flight probably last year and they boarded from the back and they said like for COVID in terms of like, you know, just keep, and mind you, I didn't fly when they were still blocking the middle seat. Like I didn't fly that, um, I guess fresh into COVID. I didn't fly until I think the first flight I took post pandemic was my birthday. I think it was our Miami trip. Everything else we did, um, road trips. So, um, I'd say August 21, right? Cause we we're in 20, yeah. August 21 was as in 2021, I think was the first time I flew. So that being said, bored from the back, everybody stay out of everybody's way. I don't want to stand here and wait for somebody that, you know, is getting their stuff together for the 12th row when I'm trying to go to, you know, row 21. I should have been able to get on before this person. And the person that is further back than me should have been able to get on before me. Everybody's out of everybody's way. I, for the life of me, don't understand the reasoning behind that. And I mean, if you want to say that first class business class needs to get on first, then okay, let them niggas get on first and then let everybody else board from the back all the way up. Or for planes that are large enough, I especially enjoy when they have the front and the back open for um, boarding and de- uh, deplaning, deboarding. I think it's deplaning, deplaning and not deboarding, but getting on and off the fucking plane. 
I enjoy when the plane is long enough, uh, large enough, and there's a back door that we can use that door to um, get on or off the plane. I've done that before. But everybody stay out of everybody's way. I don't understand why we got to hold up. I don't like the whole people brushing past me once I do sit. Like, that's another reason why I don't do the aisle seat because I don't like people standing right in my face. I don't want someone's ass in my face. I, I can't. That that drives me crazy. I would much rather an aisle seat than a middle seat. Let's not get that confused. However, I'm always going to go for the window seat because I don't want people standing right on top of me, especially when y'all motherfuckers get off the plane and, and, and just jump up to stand. Now, I understand that a lot of people sometimes by the end of the flight are just tired of sitting. So I have gotten past the everybody stay in your seat stage of flying. I tend to be uncomfortable in these little airline seats and I am not that large. So I, I get it. I am about, I'm five, five, like 145, 150. I'm uncomfortable and I'm not that big. So I can totally understand that someone with longer legs or someone with back issues, someone with knee problems, like I'm, I'm with you on the, listen, my back can't do this anymore. Right. I need to stretch. But if discomfort is not your thing, like, I don't understand why y'all stand up. Like you're not going anywhere any faster. So I'm still, I'm like on the fence with that because I feel like it may be an ableist statement, if you will to just assume that everyone can just stay seated for however amount of time. I understand people have, you know, a lot of anxiety with like, okay, I, it was hard enough for me to get on this plane and sit here for like nine hours so that we can get to this destination. I got to move. I got to do something. I got to make myself feel like I'm not on a plane. So I've gotten past, even though it annoys me, I've gotten past really thinking that y'all are fucking idiots, but I still think you're doing a lot if you're standing immediately at landing we're we got at least another 10 minutes like we're on the the tarmac like we're not even at the gate y'all we're still on the runway cool your tits um next take is checked luggage shouldn't be standard i for the life of me um completely understand and again if you've got medications that you have to fly with, if you've got products that you need to fly with, if you are transporting items or goods that you cannot check in your, um, I mean, that you cannot fly with in terms of carry on, um, I get it. I've had natural hair. I mean, I have natural hair now, but I actually had hair at some point. If you've not seen what I look like, I've got a, I got a Caesar, if you will. I've got no hair. Um, team Baldy. But, I totally understand, especially if you're taking, I mean, if you're not traveling for say a month or longer, right. Or if you're not a plus size person where, cause again, I'm small, I can fit 10 days worth of clothes in a carry on. I understand that if your clothes are just bigger, you may not be able to put all your shit into a carry on. I understand that cold weather destinations tend to be a little more difficult to pack into a small, um, piece of carry on luggage if you're not into repeating items, you know, but if you're just going for say, um, a weekend, or if you're going for something less than seven days, I really think you should be able to, again, if you're going for just vacation purposes for the most part, right? Like if you're going for work and you have to be prepared for a lot of different occasions, if you, and that could be like if your work is as an influencer and you've got to have a look and another look and a day look and an afternoon look, whatever your, you know, your bag is, if you need to have a lot of different outfits or if you need to have shoes for all these, like I get it. Not everyone can put all their stuff into a carry on. Um, however, and then also again, could be ableist here. If you're just not capable of lifting anything, so you don't do a carry on to 
avoid having to get it uh, overhead, right? Or if you know that, say, or even if you don't know, you just don't want to be responsible for carrying it and toting it through the airport. If you know that moving all your stuff is going to be difficult for you, or if you have any other um, concern or characterization of yourself that makes it difficult for you to hold on to your luggage uh, in transit from, what do you call that? Uh, Not ticketing, but like the security check to actual gate. There are a million different reasons why people could, you know, not want to carry luggage. But for those of us that are able-bodied and capable of maybe not forgetting things 30 seconds after they happen, carry on. Like, I don't get why you want to wait for luggage after you get on if you don't have to. I don't understand why you want to risk someone losing your shit or risk it get it getting to you like, 30 minutes after you land and get to the actual, what do you call that? Luggage carousel. I don't like waiting. I'm a very impatient person. That being said, I'm going to do whatever I can to expedite my moving out of the airport. I do not like airports. I don't want to be in close proximity to all of these strangers from God knows where with extremely questionable hygiene and all the germs that are available to be shared. I just, and additionally, I don't want you to lose my shit. I've had my stuff lost before. I was coming from New Orleans and my brother was away at school and he was my surprise, right? My dad usually picks me up from the airport. Instead, he sent my little brother to come get me from the airport. I didn't know this. So my dad is calling me and telling me, Hey, I'm outside. I'm outside. Just look for my car. I'm outside. And I'm just like, well, I'm stuck waiting on my luggage. I think it only took like an hour, maybe two or whatever for me to get my stuff. I ended up actually finding it. I saw it being, you know, transported to that lost luggage or to like that luggage room that they tell you to check in with if your stuff gets lost or whatever. And I grabbed my bag and then had to wait even longer because, you know, you can't just sit outside of the terminal waiting for somebody for two hours. And then my dad came and got me and it turns out he, you know, had to break the news to me. Yeah. So your brother actually came to get you two hours ago, but you couldn't leave. And so he went back to school. So I, you know, missed the opportunity to see my brother. And that was like enough for me to be like, oh yeah, so I'm not. And then also just the whole Y'all niggas lost my shit. And that I don't know if I'm going to get it back. I don't know if all my clothes and the jackets and everything that was important to me, not everything like this is my entire life, but I like my stuff. So all of that was, of course, in the luggage. And that that experience on changed it for me. I'm not a fan of, you know, leaving the safety of my shit to anyone other than me or my partner. Because, God willing, he won't lose my shit. He's proven himself to be quite uh, responsible thus far. So, so far, so great. So, yeah, check luggage shouldn't be the standard. Cancel me for that if you want. Hold on to your shit. Get it into a smaller bag. Or And, and honestly, you know good and damn well, especially if you are the type of person that always overpacks or that never uses everything that they bring, like, why do you have all of that shit? Why? Especially when you know you're not going to wear it all. I never wear everything. And even though, excuse me, I try to go as light as possible so that I can get it all into my check, um, my, not my check, but my carry on. I never wear everything ever. I've never worn every single thing that I brought with me. I OD, like, I feel like I pack drawers enough to shit myself every day. Like I've got mad pairs of underwear. I got a different pair of pants, a different shirt every day. Or I might re, um, like what I'll usually do is rewear like the jeans that I fly in, but then like, I'll have like jeans and pants or skirts or whatever for like the rest of the week. But like I have a airport uniform that consists of a white tee jeans and some chucks. And that is consistent. Like I always wear that to the airport because I'm fucking comfortable and it's a clean look. You can't really fuck up a white tee and some jeans, right? Anyway, you're not going to wear everything. 
do the carry on. Please give it a shot. I'm pretty certain seven out of 10 times you're going to be fucking fine. Especially if you don't have, um, large liquids or like really heavy things that you have to bring with you when you travel. What else I got here? Also, if you have, if you're inclined, well, no, I would say to my curly girls, if you're trying to bring product, especially if you're going someplace where you probably can't buy product when you're there, if you're trying to like condense product into say like those three ounce, uh, bottles and stuff like that that could be really hard especially if you use a lot of product in your hair i i fucking get it so in that case i mean girl do you or if you've got a medication or whatever reason do what you gotta do but just saying they could lose your shit then what you wouldn't have had it anyway or you would have had to wait to get your shit right so just putting that out What else? Ooh, okay. Here's another one. Speaking of luggage, smaller overhead items like jackets, laptops, shopping bags should always be taken out of overhead bins before customers are required to gate check shit. But all y'all that put your funky ass jackets, your laptops, or your little briefcase and your pocketbooks in the overhead space, that's what the seat on underneath is for. Like, right. The, the, the seat on like the seat in front of you, that space underneath, that's what that's for. Even with long legs, your shin is going to hit the bottom of that seat before your feet get to the complete bottom of the other person's chair. So in that space, throw your shit under there, right? Because there's no reason why there's not enough space for everybody to put one carry on up there. Those overhead bins will fit when you put them up the correct way, not flat, but on their side. Again, not flat, but on their side. Wheels in, handles outside. Short end to short end being top to bottom, not flat on the back. Eh? There should be two there should be two wheels pointed upward like the long way if you will if you're watching the video i'm doing little hand gestures here right they're gonna fit now unless of course you have like a large duffel bag that's like awkwardly sized and stuff like that that might you know cause some problems or something like that but i like i for the life of me don't understand how people can be so fucking inconsiderate you have a single jacket, right? Put that on top of somebody's suitcase. If you've got a bunch of stuff, you don't need 24 inches of space. Compartmentalize, you know, put your jacket inside a bag and put that bag on top of another bag and move it to the side so you can fit more suitcases up there. It, there's, no one should be separated from their property if it's not absolutely necessary. Move your shit, put your stuff on top of a suitcase, like make it make sense make it make sense. It absolutely infuriates me when I watch people very casually and haphazardly just put things overhead. And then like in general, people being inconsiderate of other people drives me crazy. It's just one of those things where I feel like the world would be such a smoother space to move through and exist in if we all had some level of solidarity amongst us if we all were not in the sense of i'm fighting your battles or not in the sense of i'm doing it for you so you don't have to do it but in the sense of hey if i can take two inches you can take two inches and four inches is going to be covered versus you doing four inches or me doing four inches outside of mobility issues outside of duress or some reason why hey okay i'll do all four because i see you can't do two if everybody does it two inches four inches is going to get covered think about other fucking people there's a right way and a better way while you are allowed to put your stuff up there doesn't mean it's the best way And I feel like if the best way is an option, if everybody could win, why would anybody not want everybody to win? I don't understand that. I don't understand. Um, And listen, if you've got a good reason 
as to why. Give it a shot. Shoot me that email. Dcarry at travelandshippodcast.com. I'm really curious. I can't envision a world where it makes sense to not move your shit over. Even wintertime. You know, that I get more so than like summer and spring. You don't want to sit in a bubble on the fucking plane. Cool. You know what I mean? Take that off, put that up, but put it up there, not in the space of someone else's suitcase because as uncomfortable as it may be for you to have like your coat on the floor under the seat, I ain't doing that either. I don't put coats on the floor, but as uncomfortable as that may be, we all paid at this point. And outside of somebody booking your flight for you or covering your expenses for you, our seats cost relatively the same. There's Comfort Plus, there's, you know, those exit rows. Like there's the seats that you pay a little bit more for and all that other kind of shit. But ain't nothing about you that's more special than me. Ain't nothing about me that's more special than her. We all on this metal ass boat together and we can all fit our shit together. That's all it is fucking common sense. Y'all ain't never played Tetris before? Tessellate. Put everything in there like it's a puzzle. And I promise you, seven out of the 10 times, it's going to fit. If other people cared enough about their actions and how those actions affected other people, we could all make it fucking happen. Next one. All inclusives are a fucking waste. I'm not here for them. Unless, unless, um, you're in an area that is very expensive and you want to be able to drink right on the grounds that you're staying at. So I could see, especially as a solo female, like I want to get drunk on vacation as much as the next girl, as much as the next guy, right? However, I got enough sense to not get shit faced. I would absolutely love to have my two drinks, maybe three at the bar, have a good time, enjoy my surroundings, people watch, be at a bar, like be out. And then trot my, my little self right back to my room very safely because not, well, safer than being off the, what do you call it? Resort, right? Um, unless of course it's a location where say you're not exactly safe exploring the local areas, right? Like Jamaica. Yeah. I'm not going off. If I'm in Jamaica, I'm staying on the resort. So that's like one of those three out of 10 times where it's just like, oh no, we're going to do the all inclusive. That's when it makes sense. Right. I know in Bermuda. I stayed at Grotto Bay Beach and Resort. A++, highly recommend, recommend. This was back in 2017 though, so I don't know what all it's doing now. Ouch. But if it's anything like it was in 2017, then, um, that's my little toe there. Uh, My leg is so tired. I'm trying to stretch it out. And that makes sense to you if you're watching the YouTube. If not, just ignore that. Um, but I stayed back there 2017. I was there for about maybe four nights, five nights. I don't remember. It was less than a week, but I found out three days before I left. Like it was the third day before I left. Like I had, um, two full days, no one and a half full days. Like if it was Wednesday evening, I was leaving, like that Friday night or the Saturday morning or something like that. So all that to say, you needed to have at least three days to do the all-inclusive option. It was like an extra $100 a night. I had already spent at the bar like $60 on drinks and little um, snacks or whatever. And I was talking to the bartender. He was like, oh, should I put this on your tab? Like, what's your room number? And I was just like, I don't have a tab. I'm just going to play in a card. He was just like, you sure? Because, you know, like, this, we, there's an all-inclusive option. You're not all-inclusive. And I was just like, oh, do tell. That's, I didn't know that was an option. So for like an extra $100 a night, I didn't have to pay for none of my drinks. I didn't have to be, you know, 
cost conscious when, you know, going through the menu. I want to say it included breakfast anyway without the all inclusive. I don't remember, but I remember them breakfast. Breakfast was good. I love a spot with an omelet, uh, with an omelet bar. Omelets are my favorite breakfast food. If you didn't know, omelets, bacon, and ham. I love pork, especially when it comes to bacon and thick cut ham. Uh, but that being said, that case, it ended up being worth it because I was spending on drinks so that I could drink and not have to get back to the hotel. I didn't want to have to pay for an Uber. That's a long road from, it was a, about a quarter of a mile, maybe a mile from the closest bar that was walking distance, I should say, other than on the resort. Like the closest bar off resort was about a little under a mile. Cause I want to say it was a little less than 15 minute walk, but there was no sidewalk and like no street lights. So walking there at night would have been a bad idea, especially with a little buzz. Say all that to say, if you're not doing it for say safety reasons or because you're in a very expensive area, then go outside. Why did you spend so much money to, you know, not enjoy local cuisine and local cuisine, hotel food and local cuisine. I'm exploring what options this community has to give are two different things. I absolutely suggest you try a hole in the wall everywhere you go. Ask locals for suggestions. Ask your Airbnb host. Ask niggas at the hotel where they get their lunch from, where they go after work. Like, ask questions. Talk to people. Explore. All inclusives, to me, are a waste of money because they make it so easy for you to be more sedentary. You stay within the little bubble and you don't get to enjoy. It's just like, at this point, you explored the W or at this point you explored the Holiday Inn or the Marriott. You didn't explore Panama. You didn't explore Mexico City. You didn't explore, explore Quebec. Like you, you saw what that property was like, but what did you see of the places around you? You know? And then also if you know, you have all inclusive meals at your resort, how likely are you to stop and get food while you're out and about, right? How often are you to be able to enjoy sitting at a cafe or sitting at a restaurant and people watching in the community as opposed to watching other fucking tourists? You see what I'm saying? Like, there's nothing better to me than just being in the mix of the community that I am visiting. That's me. I think your money, and then also the food is generally better and the food is generally going to be cheaper off of the resort. Win-win. Go explore. The money that you would spend in, say, an Uber or the time you'd spend on a walk is best served with you're walking your meal off, get them steps in while you're on vacation, you know what I mean? Or you're going to spend less on the food so you can spend for the Uber because you're going someplace where you're not going to spend resort uh, prices on your meals. What else did I have? Right. Oh, here's a fun one. Back to airplanes. I don't mind crying babies. Babies fucking cry. Babies cry. Right. And... They also have to get places as well. So for people that are like, oh, the baby's crying. Shut that baby up. Shut that baby up. For those people, it's just like, well, what? that's what babies do. Is it inconvenient? Does it suck? Yeah. But for the, uh, and the complaints and the, oh my God. And the being very um, demonstrative about being annoyed or inconvenienced by a crying baby is just like, it, who's the adult here, right? I was reading on uh, Twitter actually earlier today. This woman was saying that the couple next to her, there were like three crying babies on her flight and the couple next to her 
put their like and they were like in their 60s or something with putting their fingers in their ears and being real obnoxious about like they were just being obnoxious about it and it's one thing to just like cover your ears right or it's another thing to be visibly shaken or um disturbed by the kids crying right but I would much rather hear like a crying kid than an iPad on full volume listening to like bubble guppies or Coco Melon, whatever these motherfucking kids is listening to and watching these days. I'd rather hear your kid crying versus your kids programming. Right. And a couple of people were saying like, all right, just put on earphones, just put on earphones or you do noise canceling headphones. Duh. Like, why would you get on a plane without them? That's part of the game. And another person was just like, just to throw this into the conversation again, ableism. It's a little ableist to just assume that someone can wear headphones or isn't, you know, triggered or, you know, more aggressively um, disarmed by loud noises than you are. Some people can't wear AirPods or earphones. Like they can't wear anything on their ears. Like that triggers them in a different way. So the whole just put in earphone, uh, AirPods, earphones doesn't work for everybody. Right. And then also it is the, what was the other one? Some, another person had said another addition to this is that some people are just really triggered by loud noises and just like, you know, think of autistic people, right? Think of people who are on the spectrum. Like autism doesn't exist just in children. Like adults are autistic as well. Autistic children grow into autistic adults. It seems like you may not see them because adults, for the most part, generally learn coping mechanisms. They just learn to blend in. They learn to fit in and just deal with all the things that just like drive them crazy, right? However, it doesn't mean that they're still not... um, suffering through it, even though they may not display it the same way the crying baby does. So that was, um, an eye opening percept, no perspective (laughs) to be exposed to shit like that is why I like Twitter. Um, because it doesn't limit you just to the people you follow. It often, uh, not often, but I want to say if you do it right, but the way that the app works is that it definitely, um, Hey ma, just text me about her vacation coming up. Um, the way that the app works is you see tweets of the people that you follow and then comments, replies, uh, people you follow will retweet other people so that, you know, um, you end up seeing people's tweets that you don't even follow and you find new people and all that other kind of jazz. So, that was an interesting perspective and I 100 wholeheartedly agree. Um, sadly, I'm sorry for those people because I sympathize with you and my heart is with you for whatever, you know, your ailment or your, um, I don't want to say diversion or whatever your difference may be. Right. But for people that don't have some type of medical condition or, um, you know, anxiety, your mental health concerns surrounding crying babies, um, suck it up. If you can wear headphones, AirPods, do so. It's like, for the most part, and what I get pissed off with crying kids when I know the parents aren't doing anything to help their kid, like or to soothe their kid or to like address the reason why they, why they are crying. In fairness to the parents, most of them don't want their fucking kid to cry either. They got to listen to it as well. While they may be better equipped or better used to tuning it out than the rest of us are, a lot of them are embarrassed that their kid is crying on a huge aircraft full of other people as well. So this goes again, back to consideration of other people. We're all stuck here, right? And I feel like the least we can do is make it not enjoyable, but 
as safe as possible and as bearable as possible. Like I don't fucking like planes at all. It's the least favorite part of vacation. Well, planning vacations is probably my least favorite part. No, I think being on the plane with other people is the least favorite part because I can plan at my own speed and leisure and from the comfort of my own home. I can't get there at my own speed and leisure and from the comfort of my own home. So yeah. But that being said, kids is going to fucking cry. Children have to be places as well. Children have to be with their families. Children have to, children move. Adults a lot of times are flying because they're moving. Children go to funerals with their parents and with their family as well. Like same reasons that are, children have to fly for medical procedures as well. Children uh, fly for fun as well. Kids get to have a good fucking time. Like there are so many reasons why kids fly. So the idea of flying should be restricted to certain people. I mean, certain ages and stuff isn't gonna be a good rebuttal either. But um, yeah. If you are capable of wearing AirPods or earphones, do so. And the last one that I wanted to share with you guys is I personally think that there should be some type of government funding more so in the form of a like student loan rebate to an extent for students to participate in a travel abroad exchange where they go to another country, say teach English or whatever their um, language that they are proficient enough in to teach would be, or on like volunteer mission work for like Habitat for Humanity or like Doctors Without Borders or like when we had Dr. Jasmine, uh, when Dr. Bruno and Dr. Murphy come on and talk about, you know, doing um, veterinary work abroad. I think that if even in the version of it being a grant that is provided or a scholarship or like just some way for students, whether it be restricted to a course of study, like you have to be matriculated or enrolled in school, or this way it encompasses more ages. Like if you're 37 and an undergrad student, it should apply to you as well, right? You're paying tuition, you got a student, uh, you got student loans or whatever. The same as if you're 19 and you are matriculated in college and decide to participate in whatever this program is, whether it be a certain amount of money up front, or once you participate or, um, serve for a certain amount of time, you are then like forgiven for a certain amount of your federal loans. Or even if it wanted to be a private industry that did it, you know, they then pay off a certain portion of your uh, private student loans. But either way, they're the same way you can um, teach in another country for a certain amount of time. I'm not teach. Um, The way you can Yes, teach, but like in a low income neighborhood and they like to uh, forgive those teachers as loans and stuff like that. Uh, There are different lines of work that you can serve in, if you will, um, and get loan forgiveness. I truly think that there should be some program that encourages people to travel considering Travel is so much more than vacation. I tell y'all that every fucking week. The ability to experience yourself in a different view or in a different light and different surroundings gives you that opportunity to develop into a version of yourself that either you couldn't or would be so much harder to actualize in the familiarity of home And it also goes to giving you the opportunity to experience people with one, knowing that you're helping. It's not purely a touristic um, undertaking, but you're also able to be of service, right? So I really think that travel, especially for, and I don't want to say just for younger people, but for kids, but Yes, for younger people, for your typical college-aged person. I think that the opportunity to leave what's familiar 
while still being somewhat under the protections of um, being a student. And by that, I mean, you're going not necessarily like on your own, you're left to your own devices and you have to kind of, you know, figure things out, navigate things. You go under the care of a program. Like when you do um, study abroad, you matriculate at a facility or an institute, a university or whatever, overseas someplace, you still go to school, you still go to class, they help you with room and board. You know what I mean? Like there are certain things that are still provided for you. There are certain things that, you know, are put in place for your safety. I think that that study abroad could go a longer way and would impact so many more people if it would not necessarily be as much of a financial burden. I knew that when I was in college, I didn't look into study abroad because, and this was my own fault for not doing the, you know, investigating, but I was just like, well, I don't have money to travel. I can't afford that. So I'm not even going to bother. And it's just going to be a bunch of paperwork that I'm not going to have anybody's help to figure out. So fuck it. I already figured this out. I got here. So I'm going to just stay here and do what I got to do to get the fuck out of here and get a job. I think that if there were more options and if knowing that it's going to financially and fiscally benefit you in the future by taking the weight of some of those loans off, it would encourage so many more people and also people who aren't and it's not to say that like only middle-class students or only rich kids do study abroad, right? Because there is funding out there and there are plenty of grants and scholarships that are available to students to travel at reduced or um, zero cost. Shout out to Pax Light. I mentioned her quite a bit. Check out her uh, website. Check out her Instagram. That is her bag. She is full of travel opportunities and they don't only exist for um, Gen Z, they don't only exist for like the kids, you know, like the 16 to 25 demographic. A lot of the opportunities that she shares are applicable and accessible to full grown adults. Some of them have no age limit. Um, so you're not going to know until you look, that was a lesson I didn't learn, um, until I was grown. But had I known that, oh shit, they gonna pay for part of my student loans when I get out, I right, well, let me look into this because I know I don't want to have to pay it as I don't want to have to pay as much when I get out of here. So I really wish that there was some type of whether it be government plan or even a private company that wanted to fund and facilitate, you know, forgiveness of certain loans or a certain type of payment that could be only used towards, I don't know, shit, even first time home buyer program or some type of property tax or uh, credit or something makes for better neighbors. You're more tolerant of people that aren't like you. Travel just makes you more tolerant. It, it really opens your eyes to other possibilities, to other worlds. And I think that people absolutely benefit and tend to be better um, citizens, like better neighbors, just kinder to people who don't necessarily share the same, um, I don't want to say je ne sais quoi, but people that are different. I feel like if you've never been anywhere, if you've never really lit and say also you're not from like a metropolitan city, if you're from a small town and all you know is other small town motherfuckers, you know, it, it does a lot to help you grow. It does a lot to help you expand your mind and really be more, you don't know what you don't know. And until you've had to necessarily, um, accommodate other people or sometimes until you've been on the other end of help, 
right? If you're always a person that gives help, being the person that receives help gives you another perspective. If you're always a person that receives help, being able to be the person to give help is going to shift your perspective. So sometimes being able to be the person that's not from here, being able to be the new girl or the new guy or the foreigner or the tourist or whatever the, um, the word was right there, whatever the descriptor is, you know, will give you the opportunity to expand your mind. And I wish that that were available to especially, especially college or and or high school students. So that will be this week's. Oh, and as a quick little follow up, I'm very much so beach over pool any day and Airbnb over a hotel slash resort. If you didn't know that already, cancel me over that if you want to, but give me an Airbnb on a beach over a resort with a pool any day. So that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Don't forget, I would love to know what you agreed with or disagreed with. Feel free to shoot me an email, dcarry at travelandshippodcast.com or you can find me on social media and send me a DM there. Whichever mode of communication is more convenient for you, I still wanna hear from you. So double check the uh, description wherever you're listening to this to get those links. And I am looking forward to talking to y'all next week. Bye, y'all.